Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. For me, it is morning, if you cannot tell. Um, I am so excited for this one. I've never done a book club like this um, because, well, I mean, I, I don't want to give too much away or like talk about it too much before I bring on the man himself, Brando. But before I bring on Brando, I just want to hype him up because I know he probably won't let me do it to his face. So I was introduced to Brando kind of over the quarantine um, via Instagram, as, as we all are nowadays. And I saw what he was doing um, with Acting for a Cause. Basically, if you're not familiar with Brando's work, he started Acting for a Cause, which during the pandemic, um, he produced Zoom plays with incredible, incredible actors. And during a time when, you know, there was no theater, you couldn't go to the movies, um, you know, we all really wanted art and we wanted to see that. And Brando had the genius idea to get actors who were all sitting at home with nothing to do to read plays on Zoom together and film them. And I have never met anyone as creative and enthusiastic as Brando. And I was just a fan of his for so long. And, um, and then when Brando asked me to do The Great Gatsby, of course, I was so, so excited because it is one of my favorite books, which I, it had been on my list to do this book for book club for a very long time. And now I have the perfect reason to. So without further ado, let's bring on the man himself. Hello, hello. How are you? Hello. How is Los Angeles? Are you there right now? I'm just being presumptuous. I am here right now, yes. And yeah. um, it's wonderful. It's very early here. <laughs> I bet it's very early there. I'm lucky to be in Chicago. And okay. uh, not early, it's very cold. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is warm here. So there's, yeah, we have that. <laughs> That's the benefit. Well, thank you so much for having me on. Such kind words coming from another, I think, um, a person who I think uh, we're so like-minded creatively and mm -hmm. that uh, everything is connected. And when people are meant to work together, uh, you know, the seeds are planted at one point and then it grows into mm -hmm. a tree for you to have watched my work early on and to now collaborate on our first in-person live read, I think is an incredible journey to have been on with you. Oh, well, thank you for asking me. And I also like, I think because the pandemic is the reason I started my book club. And I know for right. you, the reason you started what you do, it just, um, it just felt very, very fitting to finally work together and to be able to do it in person, even though both of us, I know, the pandemic. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's, it, it's definitely, I think there was, there was the, the amount of projects that I followed during the pandemic. And I think a lot of creatives had at their disposal in terms of being able to express themselves creatively were very limited. I think that a lot of people mm -hmm. just got really drained at the beginning of the pandemic and a few creatives got very energized and you were among them with the book club. Um, there was a couple other projects, you know, shout out to, to Jordan Firstman and Day by Day mm -hmm. and emerged during this time. Um, but I'm so excited to be talking about Gatsby, which is one of my favorite novels of all time. It's, you know, a contender for the great American novel. And, uh, and I'm talking to I, the most recent iteration of Daisy herself. Um, so I, I don't know where, where we should start because there's so much to there's cover. There's so much to get through, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> I have a mental list. I think first, I just want kind of, for the people that don't know, if you want to explain like what Acting for a Cause is and kind of what inspired that and how that came to be. And then also, you know, what it was like to then take that from the pandemic into in-person readings. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Acting for a Cause emerged um, because uh, I think there's a, there's a couple different starts, and I'll give you the Spark Notes version. Um, when I was in <laughs> high school, uh, a group of us put together a group called Acting for a Cause, where we put on plays for charity. And it was an alternative to uh, our high school's theater program, because we didn't like that the high school theater program would cut people who audition. We, we would cast oh. every audition. That was kind of our rule. And... Um, oh. That kind of died out. We passed it along and eventually there was no more acting for a cause plays done at the high school. And I had gone into professional acting and had become very um, frustrated by, uh, I, I went into it for the art and for the empathy 
and saw that the industry itself was just so business oriented, which is mm -hmm. fine, but it had passed to the passed it to the point where it was losing what I had gone into the industry for in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. So I was always trying to find a way to produce something or to be the producer that I wanted as an actor as I mm -hmm. eventually moved into education. In short, pandemic happened. And I know every actor was sent home from set and I thought, I've got to start contacting these actors and we should <laughs> acting like this because I saw Instagram lives of um, like I specifically I remember Alex Wolf who ended up being in our very first reading he was on Instagram live with another actor and they were both talking about how upset they were that they weren't able to do what they love acting mm -hmm. like provide that and we're gonna do it for charity and we're not gonna mm -hmm. have auditions and I'm just gonna cast people and we're gonna do it and uh, and then we <laughs> did one and then uh, Alex calls me. He's like, you know, we I had so much fun on this first one. Florence Pugh wants it. I'm like, okay, <laughs> we're gonna do. One. And mm -hmm. was, maybe she uh, has to audition. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Please uh, send in the self tape for uh, for this. One. <laughs> um, so yeah, eventually uh, we had finished it up in August. I, I think everyone was getting a little bit of Zoom fatigue, and I didn't want mm -hmm. it um, passe. If that makes sense, I didn't mm -hmm. want it to be before. So I took a break. I produced a couple films, um, which was actually a direct result of Acting for a Cause. I think it resonated with a lot of um, people in production companies. And so I started being brought onto projects. And mm -hmm. then I was, as I plan, I'm, I'm about to direct a film in uh, spring and summer. And as I'm planning that, I'm like, you know what? I miss Acting for a Cause. And now I can do it on a soundstage. Let's mm -hmm. just do it. And so I did it. And you said yes. And... Um, and Nat Wolf said yes, and Mason Gooding said yes, and it, it's all about the yes of the actors. Mm -hmm. and, and then we all showed up to set and played. And I think that that's, at its core, what acting is about. We're doing it for mm -hmm. an altruistic reason. We're doing it to create impact um, mm -hmm. and raise for AMFAR, uh, which we can mm -hmm. get to and, and talk a little bit more in depth about. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that the mission statement says it best. Art for the sake of art and impact. And that's what we're mm -hmm. about. Very well said. Yeah. <laughs> I also think like the reason you get so many yeses, the reason that everyone wants to be involved in this is because those qualities get lost in the business side of things. And I think that especially actors really want to be involved in something that is one for a good cause and just fun where everyone wants to be there, you know, and you're just such a lovely person to work with and so excited. And it just, it's, um, it doesn't feel like work at all. And I would do a million of them if you'd have oh. me. That's so kind of you, Kaya. Yeah, I, I, uh, <laughs> I try to I do everything in love, but it's it's so easy when the work is so fun and and mm -hmm. adapt. I think that um, you know there's another side to all of this, which is that we're adapting a lot of ed very educational works. We're do mm -hmm. we did Shakespeare. We we're doing The Great Gatsby. Um, we also get to do some fun uh, like modern things as well. So we did mm -hmm. This Is Our Year by Kenneth Lonergan. We're about to oh. do The Brown Club, which is so exciting. John Hughes estate gave us the rights, you know, again, they gave us Ferris. So it's, it's all about sharing. I think, I think great works of art, um, mm -hmm. that, uh, that not only serve a purpose of entertainment, but education and being able to bring something like the great Gatsby that has a lot of historical value and present mm -hmm. with actors that, you know, a lot of people are fans of is great. So mm -hmm. thank you, Kaya. Thank you. Thank you. And I think a lot of people don't know that Brando adapted the version of Gatsby that we, we read himself. I did. And Break which quickly. like not only did he direct, produce, <laughs> star in as multiple characters and um, and wrote it. So do you want to talk kind of about like why you chose Gatsby and and also like what it was like adapting such a that's kind of like a beast of a book to try to adapt, you know, if Scott Fitzgerald is not yeah light and easy writing so that's absolutely true now actually we have not in the chat know, not shut up saying, uh <laughs> we do miss you not we do we'll be able everyone will be able to tune in tonight. if you can bring three people on can you do three people you can't can you i don't know i i we tried yesterday with mason but we'll see kenneth lonergan there and not is i wonder okay so anyways we're Let's see. Stop distracting that. <laughs> if we can, 
bring that on, I would love to. But in in prep for that, um, while you, if you want to look at at the technical aspect, um, <laughs> the adaptation. <laughs> um, I love Nat. Oh my gosh, he was so fun on set. By the way, just shout out to and the on set culture of shooting <laughs> Gatsby. That was a blast. Um, to start off, uh, so I knew that I wanted to do Gatsby for a long time. Um, when I go about choosing a play to do, there's ones that are in the public domain, which I can just do for free, like Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And there's ones that have a process to them. Like when I did Up in the Air by Jason Reitman, I had to go to Jason, mm -hmm. I had to go to the studio that made it. I had to go to the other writer and get yes from everyone, or at least a letter of, um, <laughs> a letter of <laughs> non-refusal uh, or whatever. I don't know what it's called. Um, and I learned this process of getting, getting rights for things through Acting for a Cause. Anyways, Great mm -hmm. Gatsby goes into the public domain in January. And I know I want to do it at some point. Um, eventually, basically, I, um, I'm writing my screenplay, which is called Rumshringa. And, uh, and I got really stumped. And I was like, I need to immerse myself in great writing somehow. Um, I had not adapted a play before Kaya. I had never done really? this. Really? Now. And no. <laughs> I decided to start adapting it. And it's a slow process. Mm -hmm. And I'm still working on the adaptation. And I start sending out invites to our cast. That includes you. Because um, you were one of our, our you, were, you were the first invite. You were, you were offered Daisy and you were the first person who were confirmed for this reading. So uh, all of a sudden the cast is asking for the script. And I'm like, I'm not nearly. Like, hmm. <laughs> uh, and so the majority of this Kaya was done overnight in a crazy coffee episode of All Nighter. I'm gonna be perfectly frank, that's the type of human that I am. And, uh, and what, I, what I came out with that, I thought it was gonna be like this mess of a thing. Um, but I had immersed myself in such a intense way that mm -hmm. finished my screenplay and felt good about it for the first time. And I think that's what, it's kind of like the old stories where you uh, person, young hero climbs up the mountain to meet the mentor. Um, and that's how I felt immersing myself, you know, not being able to talk to F. Scott Fitzgerald or Zelda, which mm -hmm. you know, are, are copied over from letters from her. Um, mm -hmm. But their rhetoric and their use of language and their command of language um, and their incredible storytelling helped me as a writer. And, and I feel like that's, um, that's something cool to share about the process of adapting mm -hmm. something like Paused. <laughs> there we go. I'm back. Um, so it, it essentially, I did it. Um, I ended up going into this like momentum state and it ended up, uh, I didn't know what I was going to get from it. And I ended up feeling really strong about the adaptation and it ended up informing my own work. Well, that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. And like you said, like the fact, I mean, I had no idea that it wasn't even written yet. I said, yes, I was just, I'd been wanting to work with you for so long and I was very excited. But even like when we were rehearsing on Zoom, Brando is like <laughs> on the phone every five minutes, still figuring things out, still piecing things together. And then somehow you show up and it all fits together perfectly. But, um, you know, you do all the hard work so that us as actors can come in and just focus on, on our oh. one job <laughs> and you do every other job <laughs> and act. Well What's incredible is I, I don't want to, you know, take all the credit myself. I, I was able to do the the adaptation and direct and produce and do it with peace of mind because I'm just going to name a few names. Ty Molbeck, Dave Eilers, Joe Blakey, these people on set. Jared Eng, who came in, came through and basically brokered a, a strong donation uh, from a brand, Dolce, um, the a price match. Um, and I... <laughs> That. <laughs> ah, that is taking it? over. Uh, talk about the root canal. Do um, I talk about it? I mentioned that. Yeah, that I. I, <laughs> I didn't even know that I. I said that to Nat. How did I get to Nat? Um, <laughs> so I. I planned this whole thing, and <laughs> the very last minute, I have a, a root canal. Um, and so I decide. I'm like, I'm not changing. On this and just load myself with exeteran. Um, and uh, I think that any doctor would tell you, don't do that. But I, yeah, that was, that was fun. I <laughs> had on the day of the set. Um, a I don't true know, warrior no, of the theater. True warrior of the theater. What that's you right. are. Go on. That's exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Oh God. An important uh, detail of the process. An detail of the process right there. Yeah. Very important. Yeah. That informed a lot of the, a lot of the, <laughs> um, the pace on set. It was like yeah. informed by the sharp pings of like, Oh my God, we got to move forward. Um, mm -hmm. So I was, but I was naming people that were important. Jared, um, mm -hmm. also, we had original compositions, original animation, um, Alex Mansoor, Christian Hanover. So these are just, I wanted to put those names out there because mm -hmm. everything is made with the team. And I feel like it's super important to give credit where due to volunteers. These are all people, including the actors, including myself. We're all volunteers who are giving our time for the art and for the impact um, mm -hmm. to him. So um yeah it was it was a blast of a process i i really it was i can't wait i i was so worried that i was gonna do this and i was gonna come out the other end and say i don't know if i can do more of these now i want to do not only the three more we have planned for this year or not for, <laughs> for this season um mm -hmm. but i i um i also want to like do this for the rest of my life like no matter where my career goes like if i'm my my ideal is you know directing films for the for the foreseen future i still want to in between directing to mm -hmm. do the play readings because it mm -hmm. i feel like they just transcend mm -hmm. uh they transcend the format of the way that we use our art you know in a lot of us we were you know, actors are doing self tapes characters that no one ever sees putting their life and 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 energy into that this gives an, a chance to to kind of do a a, a group tape and putting it out into the mm -hmm. world and it's experimental, it's fun, and it's being done for the right reasons. So yeah. we're working with that. Oh. Okay, let's talk a little bit. I thought a fun way to talk about the book and still talk about what we did is kind of like going through some of the main characters and kind of like your vision of them when you read the book and how you sort of tried to bring like their sort of them at their core into the adaptation and yeah. sort of why you kind of went with each person you did, like what what qualities they had. I know there's some funny stories about why you chose certain people to play yeah, certain I, characters. Um, so yeah. I thought that would kind of be a fun way um, to kind of start. We could start with Daisy if you want. I don't Let's know. With, um, so to start off, uh, Kaya, there, there was something really interesting. I, I had seen your, so I had done a bunch of plays with friends of yours, with Brandon Flynn, uh, with Tommy Dorfman, and they can't stop talking about you, by the way. These are people who I have found that in most conversations I've had them, they somehow, they, 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 I remember like. I just wiggle my way in. <laughs> I remember Brandon, we were on set for this film called Who Am I? And he'll be like, my my 19 year old best friend, my or my 19 year old friend. And I'm like, that's Kaya he's talking about. That's Kaya. And so, um, and Tommy as well. So the, I you had always been on my radar in that sense, they, everyone seems, seems to speak very highly of you. And then you had done a uh, music video with Margaret Qualley um, mm -hmm. and Rainy Qualley and Cara. Uh, and I thought, I was like, oh wow, Kai's, Kai's getting into acting. Now what I didn't know was that you were a complete theater guru, that you've been doing and watching and loving theater since you were very young, um, which, which makes a lot of sense to me. So. Um, I'm seeing you do that, then the Ryan Murphy show, and um, and so I'm like, okay, Kai is, Kai is stepping into acting. You're perfect for Daisy because it's like, they usually cast Daisy older, blonde, all these things that are just inaccurate. I know, Daisy is brunette. And so I thought there was an interesting thing um, also about, um, I think that Daisy needs to be someone who I had also seen your book club and I'd seen how articulate you are. And I, I realized that Daisy needs to be someone who is articulate and smart, um, but also uh, surrounded by a superficial world. Now, the difference between you and Daisy is that you yourself are not superficial and don't give in to that aspect. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought it was an interesting, uh, you know, as an actor, it would be an interesting challenge in that sense. Um, mm -hmm. but you could probably draw from from the world around you. You're in Hollywood. You're in this in this place. You're young, mm -hmm. uh, and you fit all the characteristics of Daisy, from the brunette to the um, to the charisma to the articulateness. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't even think that's a word. Articulateness. I just articulateness. <laughs> that that is a uh, that's it's a, a word now. <laughs> Every word is a made up word. That is a fact. Mm -hmm. so, um, <laughs> the yeah that i think that that's the gist of it and i immediately was uh i had basically sent to someone a friend that uh that i was interested in working with you and then 
next thing you know, I had sent an invite to our shared PR person, which I, we didn't even, I don't think either of us knew. That I had we had no shared. idea. And, uh, and then at the same time, you reached out to me via Instagram. It was like the perfect storm. We made it happen. Mm -hmm. So that was awesome. I Thank know. you for saying yes and for being so great. I will always, always say yes to you. Okay. Um, and I think, like, I when I was sort of, because I always loved Daisy, I always felt like she was a bit misunderstood. You know, you're not, she's, it's hard because you have so much empathy for her, but not many of the characters in The Great Gatsby are characters that you root for. They're all kind of have, you know, yes. their own thing. A lot oh. of them are making bad decisions. Like, there's no hero. Everyone's pretty self-indulged. Um, but as I was doing research on Daisy and I sort of found out that a lot of the things she said came directly from Zelda Fitzgerald um, and letters that she had written F. Scott and things that she had said and that he really based this character sort of around her, I started to understand more of like the why of the things that Daisy says and the things that she does. Um, you know, when she says like, I hope she'll be a fool. That's the best thing a girl can be in this world. A beautiful little fool that came directly from Zelda Fitzgerald. Right, and right. Um, it just, it made it deeply saddening to me. And also just, I think, made me feel a lot more connected to this character of Daisy and um, kind of understanding her origin. Because like you said, she is, she can appear very superficial, but I think there's a lot more that goes into her. Yes, yes. And I, I love, I mean, there, there, there are multiple people that are credited with being an inspiration for Daisy. Also, there's a, a Geneva King, who was a young woman that he dated as a debutante from actually from Illinois, um, who he dated from Illinois. 18 to 20. Um, and a lot of people give a lot of credit to her as kind of like the inspiration. But I, I literally, I have to turn to Zelda because literally word for word, certain passages that come out of Daisy's mouth are Zelda's words. And so I feel like people don't want to, um, you know, overly give credit, but, you know, in a sense, I think that Zelda should have a writing credit on the book. Um, <laughs> Nats is back at it again. Talk about money. He gave us like 10 minutes to <laughs> focus and then. Yes. Um, so yeah, ultimately there's there's credit to, um, the one thing about Genereva that I wanted to kind of bring up is that, uh, there is a moment where F. Scott Fitzgerald, who was dating her, and they were both young adults, um, he had spoken with her father, and her father was like, poor boys don't marry rich girls, and I just want to make sure you have that in your head. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just an interesting line that, that a lot of people stick with, and, and something to mention um, among the comparisons to real mm -hmm. life figures. Um, mm -hmm. I, I love the way that you, by the way, approached research for the role and took it, um, I think as seriously as you would any film role or theater role that you might do in the future. I am really kudos to you on that. Um, what's the next character we should tackle? Um, I think let's, let's talk about Gatsby. Gatsby. So Gatsby. Uh, since Nat is present here. Um, <laughs> first off, I had worked with Alex, Nat's brother on two plays. Um, mm -hmm. Done as mentioned earlier in this, the importance of being earnest. This is our youth. Um, and I had actually been acquainted with Alex's work and chosen Alex because I was familiar with Nat. Um, mm -hmm. I totally loved the Green brothers, John and Hank Green, and he had worked with them on The Fault in Our Stars and Paper Towns um, and uh, was on uh, John Green's YouTube channel for, for a bunch of videos as well. And I had always been, that's how I was introduced to the Wolf brothers. Um, anyways, flash forward, I sent out an invite to Nat to be in this, um, but I sent him an invite for Nick. I want him to be Nick Carraway. I don't know why I went in that direction, um, but it was an instinct. Is it because and... he doesn't stop talking? <laughs> <laughs> I think that, uh, well, with, <laughs> yes, no, I didn't know. That. <laughs> um, and, and we say that with love. I would listen to Nat talk all day, every day. Uh, Nat, uh, Nat ends up going to the same Halloween party as me in, uh, in Los Angeles. I was already there for the reading. We were still cast, casting the role of Gatsby. And, uh, and I see him at the party and I'm like, this is our Gatsby. I've been making a mistake all along. Um, I've been making this mistake. I, we were at John Hine, who's a, who's a wonderful, I think, mutual of ours, I, mm -hmm. I think, ish. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. so he, uh, he had this party and, and I see Nat working the room. And I literally went up to Nat in the party and I was like, do you want to play Gatsby? And he was like, 
And I'm like, if given the choice, if given the choice between the two roles. And he goes, yeah, I'll be Gatsby. <laughs> and that's yeah, because, I mean, <laughs> so, uh, poor, that, poor Mason. <laughs> so at, at that point, we needed a Nick. And I was like, well, so now I've changed the, the casting process entirely. And I went mm -hmm. to Utah. And I think this is a natural tr uh, transition into, uh, into Mason Gooding, who is a scene, a, a steen, uh, what, <laughs> I can't even pronounce what I'm trying to say, a scene stealer and, um, and incredibly articulate and incredibly oh. eloquent. Um, and I had been somewhat familiar. I'd watched Book Smart and I'd watched a couple uh, things from Love, Victor at one point where I was looking for, at Michael's work for a project. Um, and he had stood out to me, but I could not believe when given the opportunity to, to go through such elaborate passages, he, <laughs> he did an incredible, an incredible job. And the last monologue mm. at the very play, for those who are watching tonight, uh, it is, uh, I've never been moved by that monologue in film. It's an, or in a play, I, I feel like that monologue is just performed in a boring way because it lacks commitment or it has some sort of feigned commitment to it and Mason for some reason I mean I don't know if it was the it was the last thing we shot and I don't know if it was just that it was a long day or what but he just carried this weight and it was just masterful so mm -hmm. Mason and that was you Kaya who brought who literally pitched me Mason and connected <laughs> us and I you know credit where due so thank I you. I honestly and I've only known Mason for a short time but I truly like every place that Mason is in every room he's in is just so so much better when he's there yes. and yes. truly when you're asking about Nick I was like who would I who would I just want around you know like who would make this experience really great because I knew we already had some really wonderful people and you know like life's too short to work with people that aren't nice and aren't fun to be around and the first person I thought of was Mason and right. he said yes and it's not an easy role to take on it's long monologues and he was in right. every single scene you know we would get breaks going in and out through the chapters mason was at the table the entire time carrying the entire thing and you know when you have three page monologues people can kind of drift off but every time mason spoke everyone you know whether it was crew whether it was us was just mesmerized and he did such a great job and yeah he just really added something to that role that i've never seen done before and it just made it so interesting and and beautiful to watch hundred percent, a hundred percent. I was very worried about Nick because I had made him such a, yeah. a central character in this adaptation. I, I've always mm. been sort of con conscientious of the fact that Nick is the weakest, the weakest link in most adaptations because mm -hmm. when translated to film or to theater, it becomes a visual medium. And, um, and so you don't need the long descriptions or passages and the beauty of our, you know, we we shoot this on a black void with a black background. All that we have mm. are our, ourselves and our faces and most of it's close up um like i told my one direction of the cinematographer was like we're shooting this cassavetti style and uh which we had actually talked about a little bit I know. emotions in the face and the micro emotions and the little interactions so if we need two people on the screen one person mm -hmm. on the screen and um yeah i i feel like he took these incredibly long passages and i mean i uh i didn't know you know, going into it, what was going to happen. And he ended up making that the easiest part. So kudos to him. Kudos to him. Mm -hmm. All right, should we talk about Mr. Tom yeah. Buchanan? Sir Tom Buchanan, uh, Jake Picking. So I had watched Ryan Murphy's Hollywood. I had watched mm -hmm. Ryan Murphy's Hollywood and I had watched it for David Cornsweet. He was our Romeo and Romeo and Juliet. He did mm -hmm. Romeo on the week that Hollywood was released. So I was like, if he's given us all this time for our play on the week of his biggest release, I'm going to watch you know, Hollywood. And um, I've always been a follower of, of Ryan Murphy's work. I, I think that um, it's incredible the output that he, he puts out there. And I love the normal heart. I think that was so incredibly Oh done. my gosh. It's so good. And, uh, and Matt Bomer. Oh, so good. So <laughs> good. Um, and, and I thought that Jake did an incredible job in that show. I thought that he, um, six months later, eight months later, if I were to think of that show, you know, besides David and, and I guess Jeremy did an incredible job as well, mm -hmm. not to diminish other people's roles, but, but Jake was very memorable. Mm -hmm. And I thought he played a very nice, sweet character, but I thought this guy is a hulking dude 
who um, <laughs> love to challenge him and see him play the exact opposite. Someone who is uh, coming, who is high status, not low status, like his mm -hmm. character. And so literally I gave him the role as a challenge. I thought that I wanted to see him play a role I had not seen him play. Mm -hmm. and, and Jay truly <laughs> was, I mean, the, the amount of notes that he had on his script, the, how prepared he was. And he walks in and he just looks like a, like he was pulled out of the fifties. Oh, and stepped I, in, like it's yeah. It um, it truly was. I had I had been a fan of Jake and um, and I also had only ever seen him be nice, and then you know right. to sort of have that dynamic with him, and he is so nice also. Um, yeah. yeah, and then to be you know kind of fighting with him, it was, it was hard to not like Jake though. Right. Exactly. It, <laughs> you know. It would pull it, when he would transform into Tom, it, yeah. I wouldn't fake at all. And, and that's what made it so, I think, easy. When I saw mm -hmm. you play across Jake, I didn't see any struggle to, to be able to, um, you know, suspend disbelief and, and really argue with him. So, yeah, it, Jake, uh, Jake took the challenge. I mean, besides, during the rehearsal process, you and Jake, I was able to do maybe the most with uh, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, have like a really solid first one-on-one -on -one and really define the character. And yes, he, he he had a lot of notes and he, he took it seriously, just like you did. And I, it's it's what a director wants. You know, they quoted mm -hmm. me in Variety in, in the beautiful article they wrote about, about you and I and the cast. Uh, they, my quote was that 90% of directors, that is a very common phrase. Um, and it was it was so gratifying to be able to be the sole cast, casting person on this and to basically give someone a role and then workshop it as much as I can to see what they it's a it's a risk not to have any sort of like preview of what they're going to bring to the table but that mm -hmm. makes it, I just love the surprise element of that it mm -hmm. makes it cooler when you guys kill it and do such a great job that I'm looking at you know I've been spending the last two weeks with you all in the editing room and just oh, seeing things and I know it's 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 incredible I feel like literally like I was right before I'm still tweaking sound and narration and editing this. And, and it's out, when is it? It's out today. At it's out today at 6 p.m. LA time, 8 p.m. Chicago time. Um, and I'm still obsessively in like doing little, <laughs> little things. In My true Brando fashion, you are working <laughs> up until the very moment and up during and after moment. and... Yes, it's right. And, and, and it, again, with the incredible team behind me, that's, we've had, mm -hmm. we've had basically like a, a, a final edit since Monday. And I still, I'm like, can we do this? Perfectionist. Oh, this. I need, we need to adjust mm -hmm. this clearer. Um, last night with like sound person, we're, ch you know, changing the, the way that sound comes out. Um, mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's, it's a blast. And in very true Brando fashion, I'm yeah. very, very much. I think even when like I'm, I feel like I'll be editing my film the day before I submit it into festivals. Um, and even the after morning of. <laughs> the morning of, right, right, right. Um, yeah. True. And, and uh, just because I don't, I don't want to forget Josephine, our lovely Jordan Baker, our who yes. also is not American. Like I, I struggled already to do a voice that was not fully my own because you know there's a bit of a transatlantic thing and you didn't give any specific, you know, I want you to do this accent. But then Josephine comes in and she's Australian and she does the most perfect, incredible, articulate, wonderful, like rich voice ever. And, um, and I think she just blew all of us away. She did. I, I, I was also surprised to find out that she was Australian and I knew of her sister and her sister's work. And I knew that her sister was Australian. So it was this mm. weird, where I was like, why did I not think that Josephine <laughs> was Australian? Your sister's Australian, but why are you? Why are you? Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, um, I, uh, <laughs> I think that Josephine was, I had actually heard of her work in a podcast called Day by Day. She was directed by um, a friend of mine named Johanna Block. And they had just talked about her and, and I had seen her on a list um, of a publicist that I like to work with and pitched it to her. And um, she said, yes. And, and to be able to, I think Jordan's, Jordan's an interesting role because she has to be a foil to Daisy. She has to be a foil to Nick. Um, she mm. 
also has um, a lot of similarities to Daisy. And so it's really hard to create a distinct character. She did that. And she did that expertly. Um, and additionally, I think that, right, the additional work to, to remove the accent, to do that consistently, um, I don't know, it just takes a different level of commitment. I, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I was very impressed with her. I thought, uh, again, it was, it was one of those moments where I felt like the stars had aligned with casting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I, uh, yeah, and we, we have a couple, uh, just to mention the supporting mm -hmm. Owen Thiel, who I, I had also met through a friend. Um, love off Owen. Comedic, <laughs> comedic I love support. Owen. Love death. I love Owen Diaz. And, um, and then we had Riv Correa's, a great friend of mine from Chicago. One of the rock. Ty Molbeck, who was the, um, the assistant, uh, the first assistant director that day, uh, stepped and in. And reading all the stage direction. Reading all the stage And direction. acting and acting and being super involved in the post process. Mm -hmm. I think like if anyone needs to receive, I mean, just tons of credit, it's that guy. And on Hi. top, he's in the middle of a bunch of productions. He's gonna be in Babylon, uh, Damien Chazelle's film. He's Margot Robbie's love interest, um, from my understanding, so at, at the very beginning. So I, uh, yeah, I, I love his well. work. In, in all ends, he's just a creative and another person who I feel like, you know, mm -hmm. just like, you know, most of the people on set, I just want to find ways to work with you all again and again and again. Um, so that is, uh, that, that I'm, I'm missing Kayun Kim also came in. She's amazing. She was in a Jeremy, yeah. um, back in the day called Dad. Dad. Yes. And, uh, and I saw Jeremy at this event, uh, this LACMA event that we had all attended. And mm -hmm. I actually unprompted, he was talking to one of the actors from Squid Game about Kayun's work and how brilliant she is and how he'd love to set something up between them. And I was like, wow. So Kayun is definitely, um, I think that an, an actor that a lot of people should should look up and see her work because mm -hmm. she rides. Yeah, she's amazing. She's amazing. Um, am I missing? I feel like I'm missing some. Meyer Wolfsheim, my favorite character of the entire <laughs> entire production. Yes, I so I did step in and play a couple characters. I played Mr. Wilson and, and Meyer Wolfsheim. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and I had a lot of fun doing those. I always play a small character. I didn't for the very first Zoom read because I was terrified to. I just narrated it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I started my career as an actor and I feel like I will <laughs> not is back. I, uh, I, uh, He's as, back. as, as an actor and wanted to, wanted to be able to continue that. Um, I mean, like my, all my favorite directors have done that to some degree like Roberto Benini who like casts himself as the main role in his things and for me I <laughs> yeah right yeah, yeah yeah and so I feel like in order to be connected with my actors I you know I should always act and it's also fun to play it's it's mm -hmm. part of my sense of you know childhood and and playing make-believe it's mm -hmm. fun to to make up the story but also pop in as a character Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of fun with it. That was actually that was actually a real blast to play. It was Wolf. so fun to see you like literally <laughs> run from behind the camera and then you're like, okay, wait, and then you come running in and in do a voice also, and do the whole scene. I I the funny thing is I dress like a director most days. I'm like dressed in all black. Like I have a tracksuit mm -hmm. I wear like all the time at work. And on the day of the actual directing, I'm dressed in like a three piece tuxedo, <laughs> like Hair trying, trying to. Make the hair, the gelled hair, and mm -hmm. literally running around from behind from the, I had a director's chair. That was one of the coolest things. I've never done that before. I got to sit in the canvas chair. <laughs> you did um, have a director's chair. It was very cool. That was, that was cool. That was fun. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and actually that marks my very first time on a set directing, producing and acting, which is kind of the dream. So thank you for indulging me as a, as a cast member in that. It was a wonderful thing to bear witness to. Yay. Um, and then do you want to talk quickly, because I don't want to keep everyone for too long. It's yes. early, but oh, right, 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 um, right. it's kind of oh, about right. Amphar and like the charitable aspect of it, which I think is the biggest draw. And, you know, you approach things, I think, really with like a 360 degree point of view. Um, but then there's that extra little thing that makes you different, which is that on top of that, you know, like having a total picture, approaching it from every angle isn't enough. But then giving back, that's, like, I think, what makes it really special. So if you wanted to sort of talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. So just to preface this, um, at any time, 
in both Kaya and my bio, the link in bio, is mm -hmm. a, a link to our donation page and also the watch page for tonight's play. Mm -hmm. um, just to be very, very clear about that. Um, so as you're listening about Amphar, I would love it if everyone here made a donation, whether it be uh, something, you know, $25, $50, or even $1, because there's power in numbers. And the more people that visit this page, and even the tiniest donation, even if you're broke, I think, you know, when, I, when, I, when I've been broke, I can still give $1, right? Um, I think it, it just, it makes a difference. Again, power in numbers. Um, Amphar is a charity that was founded in 1985, um, which is, you know, usually unimportant the year a charity was started, except this charity is dedicated to curing AIDS and finding a cure for AIDS and was created during the peak of the AIDS, HIV AIDS epidemic. Um, so for that, for, for a foundation to be uh, founded at such a crucial time and then to continue all the way until now um, and to continue fighting for a cause I think longev longevity and dedication is um, mm -hmm. a rare thing to find in, in foundations. I hear about a lot of new foundations. I hear a lot of foundations that have kind of fell off, but they've been doing consistent, great work. Mm -hmm. for and um, specifically, this is a very important charity to myself because um, there was a time where I had left acting and my mother and I started kind of dedicating our lives to helping people on a person to person basis. This was um, very important for me and, and informed my work, I think forever. Uh, and, and so there was at least, you know, a couple years where we were just fully dedicated to causes. We met a homeless person who was 29. His name was Andrew and he was, he was dying of AIDS. Um, and, uh, my mother made this decision. I cannot take credit for this at all, um, but she decided to take him in and live with us. And uh, because she found, we, we found that he was going to be taken over legal guardianship by the state. They were gonna be able to make medical decisions for him, which is what happens when a disease progresses so much. And he was having um, issues of like delirium and not being able to really, uh, he wasn't necessarily uh, himself all the time. That's what happens at the end of your life. He was 29, Kaya. Um, mm. So what happened was we took care of him for six months and then he did pass away. Um, and uh, it, was, it, was such a, it was such a singular experience um, and, and learning the value of someone's life right before it ends and at the time that is supposed to be your best years um, to see someone suffer and to see someone suffer from a disease that is treatable but not curable. And so to be able to, mm -hmm. to with Amphar and to be able to work with an organization that both works to treat people but is also dedicated to curing something that took the life of someone who meant a lot to myself and my mother. And I think in, mm -hmm. in this world, um, you know, I, I feel like, like just every life is, is as important as the collective. Um, just, I, I feel like being able to do this in Andrew's memory is something that's really important and makes it that much more personal and special. So we have a beautiful organization. We have a very personal reason that I chose it. Mm. And, um, and I think that uh, we've already raised around $16,000 between Dolce Gabbana's, um, you know, initial contribution and just mm -hmm. people donating right now we would love to get to 30 that's our goal so you know we're gonna do it we're gonna do it we're gonna, even we're if everyone it. watching this live gave one dollar we would have a thousand and thirty three dollars right and and so yeah i mean this is again everyone here everyone who does this we do it as a volunteer we do it for all the you know all the reasons we've talked about before but the one reason that trumps all that is the most important is the charity aspect. The fact that we're doing it for something much greater than us and much more important. Mm -hmm. um, and that when, you know, uh, our show is, you know, just a video on the internet, um, the impact that these dollars will have made will be that much more important. Maybe this money, thousand mm -hmm. dollars will go to treat a number, a community of people with AIDS. And maybe that community would not have had access to treatment if not, um, you know, maybe it will go towards an initiative that helps homeless people with AIDS, like Andrew. And, uh, and there's just so many things that Amphar does and does well. Um, so it's a little bit off script the way that I'm talking about them. I know that they have 
rhetoric. It's beautiful. It's eloquent. It's all on the page in the link in our bios. Um, mm. So you can read about that. Um, but, but to me, it's about, it's a personal thing and it's a personal project and it's about being able to, to give money now um, to a cause that hopefully they cure AIDS and, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. it doesn't have to exist anymore. So mm -hmm. that's the goal. <laughs> well, what a beautiful, I mean, I think that's a very beautiful way to end everyone with teary eyes. <laughs> But thank you so much for not not just coming on here, but from start to finish, everything about this process was so amazing. Um, I know that everybody loves The Great Gatsby, and I, you know, there's certain books and certain things that you're like, but you just can't touch that because it's so good. And you proved that theory to be wrong because you added so much color and so much beauty to an already incredible book. And um, I really just appreciate you and all the work that you do. And I hope that you get to come on here again soon for another book that's in the public domain. <laughs> I'd love to, Kaya. I can't wait to see you again. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, uh, I look forward to, to sharing the play with the world tonight. So thank you. I know. Bye. Bye. <laughs>